Well, the topic I wanted to uh, just briefly discuss with you today, brethren, is the topic of is the topic of discipleship, because Christ referred to those who would follow Him, those who would imitate His example. He referred to them as disciples, and He even said that those who show godly love, outgoing concern to others, would be identified as His disciples. The question I have for you is, what is a disciple? You see. What is a disciple, brethren? Because we are not here being disciples of myself or Terry or, 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 or Randy or whatever. We are disciples of Jesus Christ all. And that's our primary example. So what it is, because it's a very important principle that we find in the Old Testament. And it is defined and it is identified by action in the Old Testament. But only in the Old, but also in the New Testament. Just like I, in my long... Long, longer speech before this message I told you, you know, we are not immune to what is written in the New Testament, brethren. Those are prophecies about the church of God in our time. And we have to be careful. We have to be, we have to be extra careful to watch our attitudes, to watch our motives, because we know in Revelation, Jesus Christ says that he, 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 he spent the morrow and the, and the bone and he just examines everything. He knows everything. And we do have heart, as Jeremiah says, deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. So for those whom God the Father has reached out and brought, draw, first drew to Jesus Christ and brought into a relation with him, it is especially important principles being a disciple. We, you know, we spend considerable time before the Passover and uh, soon we'll be in that time uh, to evaluate our lives with the intent. What is the intent of our evaluating our lives? The intent is to remove sin from our lives. The whole idea of discipleship is exactly to help us understand how we take that next step. We identify sin and what is that we do when we identify sin? How is it that we can take that we take the, the next step so that once we identify and remove sin, that we can keep sin from entering back in, that we can continue on the path to be a holy people. That's exactly what God wants us to be. Well, think about a bottle. The bottle, when you take a bottle, an empty bottle, it's uh, empty, and sin is the air in the bottle. The air, of course, doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> Something else has to be put in the bottle to replace the sin and make sure it doesn't come back in. And that's the idea behind discipleship brethren uh, to not only remove sin but to replace it to make sure that it doesn't enter back in that's the that's the purpose being a disciple is much goes much deeper than just being a follower you see you know you have people who think they're followers of jesus christ and then but they're not disciples perhaps that's what happens to some that's probably what happens to some people because they don't do not allow god to change their lives and again, I was so I was so uh, encouraged and, and happy to read that somebody didn't want to go to birthday party, and uh, especially not on on God's holy holy time. And now the peace is there, peace and quiet is wonderful there in the house. He said, "That's wonderful to hear." Well, that's the zeal that God wants to see in us, the zeal for His way, brethren. Because the last generation of the church, the Laodicean church has lost zeal you know oh oh it's just oh well fine it's god's holy time but yeah we can go to the birthday party as well let's just have a nice time after all it's god's time shouldn't we have a nice time doesn't matter that god said you know the birthdays are usually usually causes for all kinds of sins and 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 and, and, and every example in the bible we have when birthday was celebrated by erod by pharaoh it ended up with some kind of bloodshed and somebody losing his life or her life and so on so uh that's what being a disciple goes that's why being a disciple goes much deeper than being just a follower yes we need to follow christ okay we need to follow the example of christ because in matthew 4 verse 19 jesus christ said to them then he said to them follow me and i will make you fishers of men so yes it's there I'm not denying that it's not there. It's there. We need to follow the example of Jesus Christ. But we also need to understand that being a disciple means that a deeper transformation needs to take place in our lives. And what somebody wrote to us in the group this morning or this day or this afternoon or this whenever, whatever is the time in where you live, 
just shows that there is a deeper transformation taking place in that people in that person's life and uh, I want you to point out today hopefully what that means you know deeper transformation that needs to take place in our lives and I would like to focus briefly brethren on us leaving us with some just to leave you possibly with some specific examples I want to take a couple of examples so that we have a working definition and we can understand what it means to be a disciple a little bit better well discipleship as we view it in the modern vernacular implies that a disciple is someone who simply follows and someone who distributes or spreads ideas or doctrines and sometimes you see that in our school system our children are just required to reproduce you know or learn by heart certain definitions and stuff and reproduce things and well they're wonderful wonderful pupils wonderful wonderful students well you know so someone who simply spreads the doctrines that's how we in our modern world view a discipleship but another definition is there also it can be a convinced adherent of a school or an individual well like uh, you have all those various schools like freud for example oh let's take that example if you align with freud and some of his thought process you tend to spread his ideas and his thoughts then you would be considered a disciple of freud you know so that's how our modern world understands discipleship and that's how our modern world views discipleship as you can you can possibly see it's just being a being a something on the surface it doesn't take any any deeper transformation process and that's why i said being a disciple means much deeper thing than being just a follower even though yes we are told by jesus christ to follow his example and uh, you know in, in that way we are followers of jesus christ but you know if there is no deeper transformation that the spirit of christ is to do in us we'll just remain followers of <laughs> followers of nothing in a sense because you know what does superficial following does in our lives nothing transformation of our character that's what it is that's what is going to lead us into the kingdom of god that's what it is indication to god how much we have been dedicated to him so let's now understand how god the father god of israel defines discipleship we'll start in exodus 19 and then we'll go into exodus 20 and we'll end up at the ten commandments oh how surprising that we all know the ten commandments isn't that something yes yes but you know, think about it for a while we often view the ten commandments as a distinct body of laws or the ten you know they're those ten points in hebrew original as far as i remember it says there are ten words very interesting indeed so we often view the ten commandments as a distinct body of laws and we always view them as a distinct body of laws separate from all the other laws and the principles and the statutes and the judgments that god gave to the house of israel but the ten commandments define discipleship brethren in a very i would say pointed very concise and a very direct way indeed when you think about it so perhaps you thought about it already so it's not it's very good thing this sabbath that we just be reminded of that you see god was bringing his people out of egypt now think about egypt think about that ancient civilization and if you have found any commentaries about egypt any historical records about egypt you would know what i'm talking about egypt of that day was not much different uh well it wasn't different at all it was just a different form of society a different form of worship different form of this that and the other but nevertheless when it comes to the attitudes when it comes to a uh, mental frame of mind it was very different from our world that's why we often say that we have to leave our spiritual egypt now what happened with the house of israel israelites for a long time were not having any touch with their god they had been indoctrinated immersed in an environment that set them at odds with their god that worshipped all kinds of little you know little insects and, and, and even cats you know sometimes I, I i i joke with my cats i said in egypt if we were in egypt i would now have to bow before you and say oh oh mighty god of mighty god of something and so on they, yeah cats were worshipped because they're very very unique animals anyway so they're worshipped as gods in egypt not only cats but you know they worshipped everything else you remember when they left Egypt, what was the, 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 what was the, 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 the view of God in Israelitish mind? A golden calf. Horrible. 
And even to this day, we know that Apis, now we know from historical records, the Apis, the Deox, the, uh, you know, a calf was worshipped in Egypt. So God was bringing his people, Israel, out of that kind of environment, you know, and the environment that sets that set them at odds with everything that was, let's call it Haderic, the way of God, you know, the gods, everything was different in Egypt. The gods, the thought process, the rulership taught them to live in a way of life that was completely the opposite of their God's way of life. And very similar, you find it even today in our Gentile societies, but then everything is said against, well, even in Israelite society, when it comes to morality now, and the moral way of life, everything is set against our God of Israel, and that's that's a very big challenge for our youth. Now, as God was bringing His people out of Egypt, and as He was beginning to communicate His to His people His way of life, and how He expected them to work, remember that not to exploit their workers, how He expected them to live, how He expected them to interact with Him. He had from the time they left about two months. Because you remember, they left on the 15th of the first month. And they reached Mount Sinai about the 15th of the third month. So God had a fairly, God of Israel had a fairly short period of time to begin to communicate to his people, to these people who he was. That he was nothing of what they have been immersed in the land of Egypt. When we ultimately get to the Ten Commandments, we find him communicating his expectation and his way of life in a very concise, a very specific way for his people to begin to understand that when we find with Israel, with the Israel after the Ten Commandments, what we find? We find God continuing to communicate to the house of Israel his way of life. He continues to expound it, to enliven it, to enlarge it, and helps the people to understand more. Please go to Exodus 19. He was helping his people to understand more so that his mind, brethren, mind, then, would continue to grow and be spread out. Remember what it says in Ezekiel 37. Now we're in Exodus 19. Yes, I'm just reminding you that in Ezekiel 37, the two sticks, the house of Judah and the house of Israel, bring them together. And then God speaks about their mind and their hearts. That is what needs to change. That's what needs to subject itself to the God of Israel. You know, outwardly, we can all keep the Sabbath and we can do it. Like I've seen, I've seen that in Africa, I've seen that in Europe, I've seen it everywhere. You know, oh, oh, the Sabbath, oh, the Friday night comes, oh, wonderful, everything stops works and, and stops working. And oh, wonderful, how blessed we are, we keep the Sabbath and look at this terrible world around us, they keep pagan Sunday. Brethren, that's true. Yes, we are to stop working. Yes, we are to keep the Sabbath. Yes, we are not to go to birthday parties and, and, and things like that. Yes, that's all true. That's all true. However, it's the mind. All of those actions should be affecting our mind, our thought process. And to view the world as God views it, you know, filled with all kinds of th odd things against the God of creation, you know. And uh, it's his mind. God wanted his mind they would continue to grow and be spread out. And it's interesting to think, you know, about where Israel was from that perspective as he was, as God of Israel was working with them. Exodus 19, verse 3. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be me to me a kingdom of priests. Now, the priests were the most uh, educated and most literate class of people at that time, brethren. So that's what God wanted. He wanted his, his people to be his kingdom of priests. That's why I often say that uh, the hope of Israel needs to be an education force in this world, educating people about various things that they should know. Randy and my friend Randy and I have been discussing about the uh, healthy food, healthy organic gardening, and then and, and, and I was thinking, what can I do more 
to possibly direct people of God to eat better food, eat what God intends us to eat, and so on. Celery, you wouldn't believe a, 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 a vegetable. Uh, I, I, I got a book this recently. Cellar juice. It says it makes miracles, and I haven't read the book yet. It's in Serbian, but it's from William Anthony William. Uh, it, it probably, it certainly could be found in English. What in the, is in that book? I don't know, but that's just one reason what makes me think. You know how much we're exposed to this processed food. How much we never made made sure perhaps to understand how we need to resist processed food and all this processed food culture, brethren. Uh, the, the attacks of Satan are so subtle <laughs> at times we don't really see how subtle they can be only then later when all of a sudden melodies come oh oh I have kidney trouble oh I have liver trouble oh I have then we realize well, wait a second where does this come from we we have been eating clean food yes but we've been also drinking all kinds of stuff you know we have been eating processed foods and yeah, it was clean, but it was processed. And you can just imagine, you don't even know how many additives, how many this, that, and the other. So, uh, you know, just to bring this in, just as a, uh, as a side comment, anyway. God wanted his people, as you see here in Exodus 19.5, to be in 6, to be his kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words where you shall speak to the children of Israel, God said to Moses. At this point... The people, the house of Israel, knew they were dealing with a God that was completely different than anything that they had experienced, than anything that we have experienced in our eastern, western, northern, southern cultures, brethren. And something that may, might be norm in our western society may, may just be completely worthless in God's eyes. Think about it. Something that is norm in the society is, oh, we are so quickly to point out some uh, you know uh, you know primitive things and norms in some societies yes they're wrong but don't think that the western societies are not having their own wrong ideas and, and things that are completely at odds with God of Israel so uh, the people realized this God who had called them to this mountain out of the most powerful country at that time the mountain they were standing you know had just executed about eight weeks earlier judgment against the most powerful nation on the earth at that time he also executed judgments against their gods you know against the gods of that nation and he knocked them over like they were chaff remember he basically mocked them and 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 and, and insulted their stupid gods because you know all those plagues of egypt brethren that's what, what they worshiped they worshiped all those all those all those insects they worshiped the frogs they worshiped everything you wouldn't believe how idolatrous was was the Egyptian society. It wasn't just gods of you know. It wasn't just gods of stone, gods of woods. No, brethren, it was it was the whole of basically all animal kingdom. I mentioned cats earlier, yes, because you know, but not only cats. They they worshipped calves. They worshipped you know all the all the kingdom. And Pharaoh was the sun god. He was the sun, or he was the son of the sun <laughs> so he was the sun god he was the supreme deity being worshipped brethren so now when i say that you can just imagine the uh conflict that moses and aaron had with pharaoh you can just imagine now even deeper how the consequences would be because they're opposed in the, their eyes against the son of the sun against their supreme god and you remember the son of Pharaoh, son of Pharaoh was also among the firstborn and he died. He died in the place, brethren. Think about it now. Now think about it, implication about all of that, brethren. God of Israel showed to them how great he was. In my recent prayers, I was praying, please show God to some of these, show those witchcraft, witchcraft practitioners and all that, that you are God of Israel. That you are above them, that they cannot do anything against it. And when I listened to Forster, was it last Sabbath telling me uh, how one enemy of, of of God and God's people, pretending to be a Christian, a Christian evangelist, pretending to be a Christian pastor, how he was trying to use chewing certain roots and trying to uh, shut the mouth of God's true witnesses <laughs> at the police station because he was interrogated for several crimes. It didn't work. 
he later said to his these friends, "Oh, these witch, witch, witch doctors were very ineffective because their rules did not work. Of course, they did not work because it's God of Israel, who is above all those witches today. He's above everything. That's the God we serve, brethren, the God of creation. Remember how Jeremiah prayed to God." So anyway, those gods of Egypt were nothing to God of Israel, and as these people, the hope of, as these people, the Israelites, were coming up to Mount Sinai and they're about to be engaging with their God in a different way than anything that they experienced in Egypt, they understood at least to some degree that this being was different than any other being they had ever experienced. <laughs> yes, of course. It was totally different. It was, you know, nothing that they have seen, that they have experienced, they have heard about in their lives. Exodus 19, verse 16. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. <laughs> well, think about that. Three months ago, they were in the most powerful country in the world. Oh, you know. And all of a sudden, three months later, now these people, you know, had heard all, the, all of a sudden, they heard some trumpets. Yes, of course, in the past, they would hear horns. They had heard trumpets before. Trumpets were traditionally used by royalty to announce events and times, as we see today with the British royalty, for example. It stands to reason that the Egyptians had trumpets, yeah, because it was very advanced civilization. And when you hear about the primitive ancient civilization, rather it just discarded. When we were in school under the communist regime, we were taught that those were all the primitive, you know, uh, primitive, uh, primitive civilizations. And we now, you know, under the Darwinist evolution, we are now having, we are in the highest uh, form of of, 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 of of development, the highest form of achievement. What a stupidity, but that's what they taught us. And if you ever hear primitive ancient civilizations, just dismiss it, not so. They were not primitive at all. They might be primitive from technical point of view, from our standards and stuff, but they were not primitive at all, brethren. So it stands to reason that the Egyptians had trumpets, but they had never heard. The Israelites never heard trumpets like this. These trumpets were so loud and so powerful that people trembled. Look verse 17. And again, coming before a God that was nothing like anything they had comprehended before. Verse 17. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. So, you know, the people had no idea before this time of the power of this being, of the power of the God of Israel. <laughs> Just like Africa, perhaps, and some Africa Shimsham, African Shimsham Christians, to call them that way, false Christians, pretending to be Christians but using which doctor's power, may not have known before this time the power of this being. You see, we are hope of Israel, the world, worldwide church of God. Yes, we are the hope of Israel. We are people who honor the power and strength of this God. We are people who honor the God of creation. And we know that he is the supreme being above all. So the Shimsham Christians, let's call them the Shimsham Christians in Africa, <laughs> may not have thought, may not have ever understood that by trying to lie and deceive the God of Israel, that they, it's not going to work. It's going to fail miserably. And it failed miserably, brethren. And it's failing miserably even now. And who knows, in, in a month or so, when the main protagonist of, 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 of witchcraft in Malawi, under the guise of Christian pastor, dies, or whatever happens to him, you know, it's going to be a witness, a testimony to all of Africa of who is the God of Israel. Especially to those in Africa who were audacious enough to think that their witchcraft and their powers would be stronger than hope of Israel Worldwide Church of God. And they vowed that they are going to destroy the hope of Israel Worldwide Church of God. Not so, brethren. The God of Israel has been destroying them. It has been showing his power. 
And I knew it would happen that way. We all knew it would happen that way because it's we knew what's written in the Bible. We know that there are no witchcraft doctors or, or, or demons that can be above God. Yes, Satan is in service to God in a sense because God is using Satan at this present time to let him deceive the world. But still, God is allowing Satan to do that. So Satan by himself has no power at all. He's the arch enemy of God and his demons as well. But we still know who is above all and we know who directs it all. Yes, he's God of Israel, God of creation, God of the Bible. So, but you see, to Israelites, all of this happening in Mount Sinai was 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 frightening. Because they had seen, you know, great things. You know, this being, this being, this God of Israel came down on a mountain, lit the entire top on fire. It was like a furnace and he was shaking it like a rag. <laughs> Can you imagine that before your own eyes? Who wouldn't be shaken to the deepest depth of his soul? So these people had come before an under had come from an understanding of gods that were just, you know, stone gods that were just metal, gods that were just wood, and people who thought that they were gods, like Pharaoh of, of Egypt thought he was a god. Now they're coming before a mountain and they see what God is really like. What will be going through their mind? Yeah, what will be going through your mind, you know? Especially when they understand that this God wanted them to be, imagine, his people. That you are going to be his special treasure, his kingdom of priests, oh my. That you're going to be his nation. What were they thinking? I, I, I know one of the things I would be thinking. My thinking process would be, oh my goodness, how do I, how do I achieve this? How do I do that? Because all the reference points that I have are what I've seen and how you honor gods of woods and gods of stone and metal. But this one is different, you know. What do we need to do to be the kind of people that he that this god that this being wants us to be because everything they had experienced did not prepare the house of israel for this this god was different brethren so what god did was he explained in a very concise way what he expected of them what he how he wanted them to behave how he wanted their minds to be changed how he wants his people to act how he wants his people to interact with him Remember, he told them, when you enter into the promised land, do not look, do not examine how all these other nations, these seven that I'm kicking before you, how they serve their gods. You shall not serve your God your way. Your God, your father, you shall not serve God, your father, God of Israel, that way. That's what people do not understand. Why it is so pernicious, spiritually pernicious for the well-being, for the mental being forever, if you just do and serve God differently than how God of Israel was to be served. They don't get it that Christmas and Easter and Halloween and all these series of all these various, various uh, holidays are exactly the way how people in the ancient times on Sundays, Sundays, worship their gods with all kinds of things, with sacrificing their children, with sacrificing perhaps animals, with with this kind of mindset that is horrible, trying to appease the demons in their lives. Well, that's exactly what the witchcraft people, witchcraft practitioners are doing in Africa today. They have to appease their demons, you know, so that their demons would bless them. And we know that. But the problem is when they, when you have people like that creep in among us, brethren, Disguising in disguise of Christians. Oh, they want to do the work. Oh, they want to be they want to be Christians. Oh, they want to spread. Of course. Oh, please, we need some money. We're so poor. We can't achieve this, that, and the other. Of course you cannot. Because they serve demons, brethren. And all of these all of these things that affect the African continent all the time, all the very various, various melodies and earthquakes and, and, and coup the attacks and all of that, brethren, that's all part of their culture and they're not the only ones when you look at the caribbeans the beautiful caribbean islands oh my good grief when you look at those caribbean islands when you think about all these witchcrafts being done there take for example the nation of haiti 
the nation of Haiti is a case in point. You know. And what a what an irony of our modern times. Right next to the nation of Haiti is Dominican Republic. The only nation in the world that has the Bible on its flag. But obviously they don't get they don't understand what is in the Bible because the uh, capital of Dominican Republic is called Santo Domingo, Holy Sunday. Brethren, the world, our world is sinking, sinking and wallowing in its uh, not only in sins and, 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 and lawlessness, but in confusion. In confusion, you know, total confusion in the world. And there are prophecies in the New Testament, like I told you, about mental confusion and all kinds of attitudes. In the New Testament, brethren, which is written for the Church of God. Now, when you think about the Church of God as a spiritual organism, as a body of Christ, as people scattered all over the place, when you think about all this division among the body of Christ and stuff, you wonder. You wonder. Well, you don't have to wonder. Just start reading the New Testament prophecies. And the most horrendous one right there in Matthew 24. That says, who endures to the end will be saved. But before then it says that love of many in some translations even most will grow cold and then you wonder well wonder how come this division how come this animosities how come all of this well because sadly but expectedly we can expect the uh, those were the uh, prophecies of Jesus Christ and his word is truth so uh, sadly or not you know his prophecies have come to be fulfilled Anyway, back to the Sinai. So here was God who gave to the house of Israel an overview, so to speak, on how they were to be his people. Then in Exodus 20, we are coming to Exodus 20, verse 1, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You see, so here we have now the Ten Commandments. And we often, as I say, we often in our minds, we separate the Ten Commandments from his other laws, from the other laws of the God of Israel. It's almost as we, if we consider the Ten Commandments more important than other laws of the God of Israel. But when we do that, brethren, we lose something in understanding because the judgments, the statutes, and all the laws that God of Israel gave to the house of Israel came from his mind. When we look... God tells his people, for example, if you go to Deuteronomy, verse 20, uh, chapter 22, for example, he, you know, what he tells his people is, uh, he tells them to put a parapet around the top of their house on their roof. I'm not sure if you pronounce that word parapet like that, but I think that would be the pronunciation. I would just, you know, just makes sense to me. So God does it, we would say fence, to put fence on your balcony, basically. But anyway, he does that. Why does God of Israel do that? He does that because God of Israel wants to show people how you have outgoing concern for others. Deuteronomy 22, verse 8. When you build a new house, then you shall make a parapet for your roof, that you may not bring guilt of bloodshed on your house. Hold if anyone falls from it. You know, if somebody is in on that house... And very often people, you know, tended to do that at night because it was cooler to sleep on the top of the house. They would sleep on the top because of that. God didn't want somebody accidentally falling off. You know, somebody gets up in the, at night and says, oh, let me go to the toilet or whatever. And then just falls because there is not a parpet, you know, on the top of the house. So you see, God is concerned with those things. Uh, he didn't want somebody accidentally falling off. Somebody losing life. And then that whole household would be basically guilty of bloodshed because it didn't secure its top. So God was, you know, all, all this principle was teaching the people, the house of Israel, how to actually, how you actually show outgoing concern for others. It was showing them how to exercise his law of love to other people. But gentle mindset, I have to chime in with gentle mindset, Brandon, all the time. Gentle mindset doesn't care about the sanctity of life. They wouldn't put parapet on the top of, you know, somebody would accidentally fall. Oh, the one who falls would be guilty in gentle mindset. Oh, stupid person. Why did he, why wasn't he careful enough not to fall off the top of, of the house? 
That's how gentle minds and brethren thinks. That's how gentle minds and thinks. And it doesn't have any outgoing concern for the neighbor. Now, as we progress after this time, God of Israel continues to teach the people, the house of Israel, and help them understand how to live, how to have his mind, and how to project that mind and live in a physical world so that it reflects his nature, who and what he is, you see. And to learn to apply his mind in life so that others can see it. And that's exactly what we have been in the process. We're in the process of this deep transformation, brethren. It's not what we do outwardly. Oh, we keep the Sabbath. Oh, we keep the holidays. We don't eat this, that, and that. That's all, that's, it's all part of Christian life. But it's a mind. It's the outgoing concern. It's the mind that is, that is what God is concerned. We're learning how to be his light. In effect, that's exactly the point that the Ten Commandments are making here in a very concise and very focused way. Think about the progression that you see in the Ten Commandments. You know, the first commandment, Exodus 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. So God of Israel is telling his people, look to me, have your connection with me, make sure that I am the focus, that you love me with all your mind, heart, strength, intellectual strength, mental, you know, strength, uh, physical strength, whatever you have, just, you know, focus on me. Make sure that I'm the focus. Make sure that I'm your top priority. Make sure your thoughts are on me. Make sure that is where your connection is. Then we go to the second commandment, verse 4. He's telling this to a people who came out of a society that was in complete conflict with him, the God of Israel. You shall make, verse 4, make for yourself a carved, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water or under the earth you shall verse 5 shall not bow down to them nor serve them for i the lord your god am a jealous god visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me now you see why it is brethren why i always insist to be careful not to fall into the into the a, a, a cults into the religion of paganism that is still extant in our societies all over the place. Why? Because he's visiting iniquity, the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, but showing where six mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So God of Israel tells the house of Israel in the second commandment, do not look at the things around you, the gods of wood, the gods of stone, the gods of metal. They're not gods. I'm your God. Don't make images and think that that represents me. And to many of you in the West, that, that, that doesn't make sense. But when you look at the Catholic and Orthodox iconography, you would understand, you know, icons of Saint, Di Saint, Saint, Saint Demetrius was, was, was the most recent, was the most recent saint they celebrated in my country. Then uh, icons of, of, of Saint Nicholas, Saint Nicholas, our father, plead before God for us is the outcry of the Serbian Orthodox population, brethren. Every St. Nicholas, which is 19th of December. So don't make images and think that that represents me. Don't, don't set things up in your life and think that that is me, you know. Go back to the first commandment. Have you connection on me? Then we come to the third commandment. We often view the third commandment as a prohibition against using his name inappropriately or saying it inappropriately, which is very common in our societies. But brethren, that's not, e not, that's not really the point that God of Israel is making in the third commandment. Yes, it includes that. We should never use his name inappropriately. But that is not the point that he's making. He's just, he has just told the people of Israel, that he has brought them out of Egypt and that he wants them to be his nation, his special kingdom of priests and kings. His priests, his special treasure, his people. In effect, they were to be his, now listen to this, representatives as they go out now. As they go into the promised land, his people were to be representatives of him and point of the God of Israel, 
was that he wanted them to be his people, his special treasure. So the third commandment specifically states in verse 7, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now the word take in the Hebrew implies to take up, to bear, or to carry. The idea, this word is conveying, brethren, to the people here and by extension to us hope of israel worldwide church of god today is that we are to take up his name and we are to carry it in a certain way in other words they were to be his representatives his ambassadors if you wish as it's mentioned by paul in second corinthians chapter 5 verse 20 you're ambassadors of christ you're ambassadors of christ so we are we are basically foreigners because why because we advocate a totally different state we advocate a different kingdom we advocate a different world world to come as paul calls it in hebrews so brethren we are ambassadors of jesus christ and that's exactly what is our identity as well to be the ambassadors we are foreigners to this to this earth to this to this system to this to these nations and I wish I prayed, after thinking about all of this, I prayed yesterday that all of our houses will be ambassadors for Jesus Christ because I remain part of our Hope of Israel library here. I called it world to come, but I thought, well, it's a bit too long and the world to come, we know it's coming. We, we, we don't really know how it will look like. We do know how it will look like, but we cannot really experience it right now when we are in flesh and blood. And I thought perhaps I should rename it. I was thinking, oh, yes. Why did I call it ambassador? We used to have ambassador college. The ambassador was named exactly because of what we are, what, we, what our identity should be based on the Bible. So I'm like, oh, let's call it ambassador. And the other part of the Bible I used to call, you know, something like uh, uh, pivotal uh, information on Israel. But I thought, oh, key of David. Isn't that key of David? We learned that from Jeremiah chapter 33. Why? Wonderful. So I renamed it key of David. Where all the books and materials are proving about identity migration, uh, heraldry of the house of Israel. Now back to third commandment, brethren. The other word, so the word take, mean to take up, to bear, or to carry. The other word we should be pay, paying attention to is the word in vain. The Hebrew term for the word in vain uh, implies actually emptiness. Emptiness, the point the God of Israel is making to his people as they stand before this mountain that is on fire like a furnace is, telling the people to lift up and bear his name, to be his people and carry his name in a certain way that is not fraudulent, you see. That is not a fraud of which, well, they have a fraud, you know, we there is a big fraud now in our former, in some of our former association that, you know, is now going to be scandalous to many people. But, you know, the fraud. When people are false Christians, false fraudulent, they are just prone to doing all kinds of things for the sake of money. Again, Gentile minds and brethren. The big fraud is now out there. The big fraud that was that Terry Nelson, our friend, was led by God to, to all uh, cry out and, and, and to discover. And he discovered it. And he shared with others about the big fraud and we tried to warn of the consequences of the big fraud but you know the person who is supposed to heed us did not heed us and now we're going to see a great demise at least in africa the shim sham uh, the big so supposed, supposed big open door in africa has turned out to be a shim sham of africa indeed nevertheless again we do enjoy uh, a wonderful uh, 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 trust by the government of a state small country of malawi which obviously is showing us gratitude for the fact that we have been what we have been doing as ambassadors of christ serving their nation trying to protect it from witch doctors and false christians and and and, and harmful things and i wouldn't be surprised if you know in the in these years ahead of us god will bless that small nation with with, with, with tremendous produce with resolution of hunger for example and things like that because they're willing to cooperate they're willing to take us as ambassadors they're just willing to give us even honorary citizenship they're willing to you know do something that is good righteous 
It's it's absolutely beautiful. And by the way, witchcraft in Malawi is banned by the law, which is beautiful. It's outlawed. Of course, that doesn't mean that people cannot violate that law privately if they wish, but it's banned. It's not allowed. It's not tolerated. It's not encouraged, which is a wonderful pretext for a nation in African continent to thrive. And we want to see it thrive. And we'll do the best we can to see that nation thrive. The first nation in the world, and we will always remember that, March 9th, 9th 2023, the first nation in the world that registered us with a wonderful, flattering, to me, flattering comment. You are the true Christians. Brethren, there is no better thing to experience. I said it many times. The people of the world can feel that we're true Christians, that we are ambassadors for Christ. True Christ is beautiful. It's amazing. It opens up the door. It opened up the door for us all already anyway. And I, you know, in the, in, in the years ahead of us, when we are expecting the rise of the European beast, when we expect all kinds of developments in the world, I wouldn't be surprised if, if amidst the world chaos, a small nation of Malawi may experience prosperity, progress, peace, growth, you name it. You name it. So God was now telling Israelites, our ancestors here, that not taking his name in vain, not taking his name in a way that is not fraudulent, not speaking about Christ and the Bible as means to gain something or to deceive people, you see, who were, the, who were supposed to be his people to carry his name in a way that is not fraudulent, that is not worthless, carry his name in a way that reflects who and what he really is. And again, the point was that they were to be his nation. The ancient Israelites were to be his light in the dark, in the dark world, so that when people came into contact with the nation of Israel, they were supposed to reflect his nature and his character. That's what, what God was telling them here through the third commandment. That's exactly, brethren, what Christ communicated to the disciples before his death. The exact same principle. But how were the people to do that? Well, they were indoctrinated in another system. I'm talking about the ancient Israelites. In another system, and that you know that system put them in conflict with this being. How were they to do that? How were they to know what to do? What were they to do? Well, how were they to carry his name appropriately? If you look at the rest of the commandments, God of Israel tells them how were they to proceed and how were they to do that.